On behalf of Dean and Director Gregory S. Rose and our entire staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Warren G. Harding Symposium at The Ohio State University at Marion. My name is Gary Imes and I serve as the chairman of the Symposium Advisory Committee. Thank you all so much for joining us today. The Warren G. Harding Symposium is an academic, social, and cultural exploration of the life and times of America's 29th president. For the past 10 years, the symposium has partnered with the Ohio History Connection, the Harding Presidential Sites, and others to present in-depth research and analysis by authors, historians, researchers, and experts in the Harding era and related areas of interest. Past presenters have included civil rights era pioneer Ambassador Andrew Young, author and former White House counsel John Dean, and Capricia Marshall, former United States Chief of Protocol. The theme of the 2020 Warren G. Harding Symposium is America in 1920, the year of Warren G. Harding. Today, we will focus on 1920, the year that our nation's attention turned to Marion, Ohio during the famous front porch campaign of Senator Warren G. Harding. 100 years later, Marion is again at center stage as we celebrate the centennial of Harding's successful campaign, highlight his White House legacy, and explore the dramatic evolution of our political parties in the ensuing years. Usually presented as a two-day event on the third weekend in July, the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to make dramatic changes as we plan for this year's symposium. Today, we are joining together for a live two-hour webinar hosted here on Zoom. This new format will provide our three speakers with 25 minutes each for their presentations, followed by a 10-minute question and answer period. Our panel participants today are Dr. Nicole Hemmer, Cheryl Smart-Hall, and Michael D. Barone. Welcome to all of you. And before we begin our presentations this afternoon, I want to describe the format that we've chosen for all attendees. All microphones have been muted and the sharing your video feature has been disabled. Please note that live closed captioning is available and the webinar is being recorded today and will be archived. During each presentation, we encourage you to submit questions for the presenters and we will attempt to cover as many of those as possible during the question and answer segments following each presentation. And finally, a survey with a video link will be shared with you in your browser at the conclusion of the symposium. We hope that you'll take a few minutes to provide some feedback to our staff. We would appreciate that very much. And now before I introduce our first speaker, I wanna share with you a poll question that our staff has come up with just for fun. You will be able to respond Please do so now and we will share those responses. Here's our first poll question. Ah, there, there are the results I think that you can see, and by a large margin, margin, 93 percent of all those who responded have chosen the Great War as the answer for the question, what name was originally used for World War I? And I know that we'll probably touch on that in Dr. Hemmer's presentation coming up very shortly. And now I am pleased to welcome back to the Harding Symposium our first presenter for the day, Dr. Nicole Hemmer, is the research scholar at the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics at Columbia University. Prior to joining Insight, she was assistant professor in presidential studies at the Miller Center of the University of Virginia. Much of Dr. Hemmer's work bridges the divide between academia and the public. A published author, she has also written about politics and history for the New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Republic, and the Washington Post. Dr. Hemmer continues to build her career as a scholar of American politics and culture. 
Welcome, Dr. Nicole Hammer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, I'm going to be talking about 1920 today. And there are times when the past really does feel like a foreign country, when what people are thinking and experiencing seem completely foreign to us. And you need historians to come in and do the really hard work of translation just for you to get your, your bearings. Um, and then there are years like 1920. Mark Twain famously said that history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And as historian Carol Anderson recently said, we are in the Ryman times. Um, there are so many similarities between 1920 and 2020. 1920 saw the United States emerging from a global pandemic. It was a country racked by anti-Black violence and surging anti-Semitism, seized by a fear of terrorism in the midst of a deep recession. The Attorney General used extraordinary power to combat what he labeled the threats of anarchism and socialism while women around the country were on the march for their rights. Like 2020, 1920 was a year of extraordinary unrest, as well as sweeping social and political change. And while there would be a craving for a return to normalcy in the US in 1920, the US would never return to what it was prior to that year. It had been dramatically changed by the confluence of forces roiling the country. And so today what I want to do is look at some of those forces as a way of sketching out what this newly doubled electorate was facing when they entered the voting booth that fall and what the many millions who could not vote saw when they looked out over their country. And so I'm going to look at four major upheavals of 1920. And I want to start by noting that this is just a fraction of what was going on in the U.S. in that year. Um, there's not enough time, even in 25 minutes, to cover everything that was going on, um, including the aftermath of the Great War. I'm going to mostly focus today on what was happening, happening domestically. But I think even just this small slice of what was happening in 1920 should help us understand why there really was this craving for some kind of return to normalcy, but also why such a return could never actually happen. So first, I want to talk about that big electorate rewriting move, the 19th Amendment. Just last month, we marked the 100th anniversary of its ratification, just months before the 1920 election. And I think we should pause for a second and think about this. I mean, it was only two months before the 1920 election that the electorate virtually doubled overnight. It happened so quickly um, that for instance, when the, the first woman registered to vote in Tennessee, and this was her registration card. Um, her name was Beb Byrne, and her registration card says, you know, his registration number is one, and he is entitled to vote in the 4th Precinct, 1st District of McMinn County. This change happened so quickly that there wasn't enough time to create new voter registration cards in time for the 1920 election. And you can see even in this, the way that all male voting was deeply embedded in the system of many states. So the ratification of the 19th Amendment came after continuous activism. I mean, this is something that had been fought for since the mid-19th century, but particularly in the 19-teens, there had been marches and protest as suffragists put pressure on Congress and President Wilson to recognize women's right to vote. And while we tend to think of this fight for women's right to vote as very sort of genteel, kind of protest, it actually was some pretty fraught activism in a lot of ways. In 1917, police arrested 168 suffragists for protesting outside the White House. Um, here you can see Alice Paul um, on, at least my left, um, in prison. And in prison, women like Paul were subjected to harsh treatment, including the force feeding of activists on hunger strike. Now, women would win the right to vote just three years later. But another, I think, misconception we have about this moment is that it signaled an end to the fight um, for women's rights and women's suffrage. And many women in 1920 didn't see this as an ending point at all. 
white women would push forward with the move for women's rights. They would fight for women's health care, for access to birth control, for the Equal Rights Amendment. But there were also women who were still fighting for the right to vote. Black and indigenous women in the US didn't have the right to vote starting in 1920. Um, I'm showing you just a few of the leaders of that continued fight here. Hallie Quinn Brown, um, who was a leader in the fight for black women's suffrage. Gertrude Simmons Bonin, um, also known as Zikala Saw, who was fighting for indigenous women's right to vote. Um, indigenous women and indigenous people broadly wouldn't have the right to vote across the United States until the 1950s. And for black men and women, that right to vote wouldn't be secure until 1965. I should also note that political rights weren't the only thing that women were fighting for in 1920. They were inaugurating a new culture of dating and dancing, a new, more modern approach to womanhood. And kind of leading us into um, something I'll be talking about later, this was a contested battle for women's new culture in the US, um, particularly these new sexual mores, um, the Ku Klux Klan, which we'll talk about more, you know, it emerges sort of reborn by 1920 and it's policing all kinds of things. Um, there's anti-Black racism and violence, there's anti-Jewish and anti-Catholic violence, but the Klan was also policing sexuality. Um, the Klan Nikki, committed I, violence against- Nikki, I'm sorry, Go ahead. we can't see your slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me see what's going on. How about now? There we've got it, good. Great, great, thanks. Um, so here's the Klan marching in Washington in 1925. Um, so this Klan, um, as I was saying, it, um, it policed not only things like race and religion, but sexuality as well. There was clan violence against people who engaged in extramarital sex, in petting, and uh, clan violence against abortion providers as well. So the second big destabilizing event that I want to talk about um, is this uh, labor violence that was happening in the United States in response to a massive post-war depression that started in January of 1920. So there was this recession that happens immediately after World War I, and starting in 1920, there was a depression that was marked by extreme deflation, caused in large part by the huge expansion of productive capacity in the United States during the war. During the war, all of the factories, all of the farms were um, turned over to war production. And so they had increased their capacity tremendously, but then after the war, the government was no longer buying up the things that factories and farms were producing. And so what ends up happening because of this overproduction is that prices shrink dramatically and along with them, wages go down. And so you have this labor movement that is fighting for workers' um, rights and for workers' wages. And over the course of the years following World War I, the size of the labor movement in the US grows pretty dramatically. Union membership in January of 1917 was under 3 million. By January of 1920, there were over 5 million Americans involved in the labor movement. However, um, there were all of these strikes that happened in 1919. You can see here, um, Seattle called a general strike for workers. There were steel strikes and coal strikes. And by and large, these massive strikes of 1919 failed. And so when workers are pressing for their rights in 1920, they really don't have a ton of leverage because it's already been seen that these work stoppages um, ultimately didn't get workers what they wanted. Which is not to say that everybody had it bad in this period of economic dislocation after the war. The U.S. had 42,000 new millionaires after the war than it did before. Um, and one of the big stories of the 1920s after this is the way that inequality would rapidly escalate throughout the decade. Now, this 1920 depression would end. It would end in 1921. And over the course of the 1920s, these lower prices plus more stable wages would help feed this emerging consumer culture of the 1920s, um, something that was fed by innovators like automobile producer Henry Ford. <laughs> 
Henry Ford is usually mentioned in this context in terms of what he did to streamline production in the automobile industry. And he absolutely did do that. The sort of Ford miracle of the 1920s is one that is well known and well studied. But he did something else in 1920 that I want to talk about because it leads us to the third destabilization um, that I want to talk about that was happening in 1920. In May um, of 1920, Ford publishes this newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. And on the front page of the paper on May 22nd was this story, the international Jew, the world's problem. And over the course of the next two years, once a week, Ford would publish the Dearborn Independent and it would be full of stories like this, stories that Ford pulled from these papers that he'd gotten from a Russian emigre um, called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now this was an anti-Semitic hoax, but Ford bought into it. And he spread this hoax across the United States. And it wasn't just that Ford himself was indulging anti-Semitism, but he was helping to feed this anti-Semitism in the US um, and anti-Semitic violence in the US. And again, this, this new clan of the 1920s was a big part of enacting that violence against Jewish people. And nor were Jewish people alone in this. The years around 1920 saw some of the worst racist violence in the US since the end of the Civil War. In 1919, more than three dozen cities were sites of racist pogroms, including Chicago and St. Louis, and that same year witnessed more than 100 lynchings. Um, so why is it that in 1919, 1920, 1921, you see all of this racist violence in the US? Well, part of it has to do, again, with World War I. World War I really does change domestic life in the US. And for Black Americans, it does two pretty big things. Um, one, the war helps to trigger the mass migration of Black Southerners to the rest of the US. This is the start of what is known as the Great Migration, which is one of the largest internal migrations in world history, um, the movement of Black Southerners to the rest of the country. And so with that mobility um, came higher wages for Black Americans and a new presence for um, Black Americans in places in the US where they simply hadn't had any sort of critical mass before. Um, the other thing that World War I does is for um, Black Americans who are serving in the military, they're spending the war fighting for democracy abroad. And they come back to the United States and they want to fight for democracy in the US as well. And this was beautifully captured by W.E.B. Du Bois in May of 1919, when he writes um, in the, the magazine, The Crisis, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. And this idea that there is a, a fight to be taken up for um, black political rights is a really important thing that's happening immediately after the war. And so this extreme violence that we see in the US in 1919, 1920 and beyond is really a response to both of these things. Um, the violence was meant to subvert both black mobility and black citizenship and to reinforce a system of white supremacy that would also be reflected in the nation's immigration laws uh, in the 1920s. And so immigration too, is um, part of this story. And it's tied to the fourth and final dislocation or disruption that I wanna talk about, which is the Red Scare. So immigration was at the heart of this fear of new political doctrines, particularly the ideas of anarchism and socialism. There was this real belief in the United States um, particularly by native born peoples, that immigrants from Russia, from Eastern Europe, from Italy, Jewish immigrants were behind the political unrest in the US. Um, and this was tied to all sorts of things. It was tied to the labor movement. Um, what were called at the time race riots in the United States were often tied to, considered to be tied or believed to be tied um, to anarchists and to socialists. Um, and in 1919 and 1920, there were a string of mail bombings um, that didn't have a particularly high casualty rate, but that did sort of help to uh, fuel this fear of socialism and anarchism, but by extension, immigrants as well. 
And one of the people who was most attuned to and most responsive to this fear and who helped to enact the Red Scare in the U.S. Um, was Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Um, Palmer, in February of 1920, warned that what he called alien filth and alien criminals were pushing unclean doctrines in the United States and that something needed to be done about it. And one of the reasons that Palmer was focused so much on immigrants was, you know, again, this, this general fear that immigrants were the source of all of this unrest, but also he had tried to go after native born socialists and the courts came back and said, well, this is just freedom of speech. This is um, their, their first amendment rights. Well, what Palmer figured out was that for immigrants, it didn't necessarily, they didn't necessarily have those same rights, right? Immigrants could be deported for spreading um, the doctrines of socialism and anarchism, even if they weren't being violent. And so this is the idea, this idea that you can round up and deport these immigrants that lead to what were known as the Palmer Raids. Um, the Palmer Raids come out of the Department of Justice um, and they're aimed at immigrants, violent and nonviolent, who spread what Palmer saw as dangerous political ideas. Over the course of just a few months in the U.S., more than 10,000 people are arrested in these raids, although only around 550 were deported. This is actually a really, really important moment um, for a couple of reasons. One, we often think of the 1920s as this time of kind of a, a return to small government or a commitment to small government in the US. But it is also the moment where we see the first real growth of a national security state. It's coming out of uh, the Department of Justice. It's coming out of the Bureau of, of Investigation. This is when J. Edgar Hoover is making his way up um, to eventually become the head of the FBI. Um, and you also get that response, right? So the ACLU is founded in response to the Palmer Raids and that fight between national security, the security powers of the government, and these ideas of civil liberties, they're going to continue to come into conflict right through to present day. But the, some of the origins of that fight um, we can see in 1920 itself. All right, the last thing that I wanna talk about is something that happens um, just about a month and a half before the election. So you have all of this ferment, all of this unrest in the United States, but things actually get a little bit worse in the fall. On September 16th, New Yorkers who are hanging out in the financial district um, watch as a horse-drawn carriage carrying 100 pounds of dynamite and 500 pounds of cast iron weights explode in a timer set detonation. Um, if you, you can see some of the pictures here, this was a massive explosion. Um, the horse and the carriage were obliterated in the explosion. Um, the driver was believed to have escaped. 40 people die, hundreds are injured. But this crime is never actually solved. I mean, it's pinned on anarchists and immigrants and, and may very well have been carried out by the same um, anarchist group that had been behind the mail bombings, but it, they just don't know. Um, but at the time it was, the deadliest terror attack in US history. This is happening just, you know, about six weeks before the election. And so this sense that America is coming apart at the seams, that it is transforming in radical ways is something that is suffusing American culture already, but is made very visible um, at this moment in uh, September in New York. Now, what's notable, um, particularly given the backdrop of the Red Scare, um, the sense that the biggest threats to American democracy are um, anarchists and immigrants, is that this is only the deadliest terror attack in U.S. history for about a year. Because a year later, the death toll is going to be surpassed by the anti-Black massacre in Tulsa um, in 1921. And so... You can see here where these confluences of violence, of political unrest, struggles over what the future of the country are going to look like are being played out in extraordinarily violent ways in the United States across the country. 
And one of the remedies to this, or one of the things that um, people are doing to try to, to um, solve some of these problems is that they are going to vote. Um, and in 1920, you do have an election in the United States um, where, of course, Warren Harding's big call is this call for a return to normalcy, something that I think many of us can relate to, especially in this time when, again, we, we see a lot of these same problems in the U.S., whether they're pandemics, um, whether it's anti-Black violence and anti-Semitism, whether it's a changing electric, a lot of these same issues are coming up today. And there is, again, a call for things to return to normal um, that, are sh that are shaping the election. There are actually polls out there that show that uh, the majority of Americans want to see some kind of return to normal. And I think that the word normal all right, I think we, we all have sort of a sense of what it might feel like or mean like for things to be quote unquote normal again. But the, the word that I think historians would want to hold up to the light a little bit more is the word return. Um, this idea that you can go back through the voting booth and get yourself back to a time before all of these historical forces um, really began to rewrite politics and culture in the US um, not entirely possible. And so one of the, the phrases that we hear so much today is this idea of the new normal. Um, and I think that, you know, as people go into the voting booth this time around, um, they are going to be weighing those ideas in their mind, the new normal versus a return to normalcy, um, and just a, a, a thought in their minds about how do we deal with all of these confluence of forces that are reshaping our politics and what do we want the world to look like in the aftermath of everything that we've seen over the course of the past year. Um, I am going to end it there except with one more slide and this is a um, the front page of the Jackson Daily News on November 2nd, 1920, um, which reminded all of the people in Jackson, Mississippi, not to forget to vote. Um, and I will leave us with that exhortation as well. Polls are open all across the United States right now. Um, and this is a good time to just make sure that you have a plan to vote um, and that you don't forget to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. We really appreciate uh, your, your comments and your explanations. Uh, and we do have a, a time now set aside for some questions and answers. And I'm going to be reading some of the questions as they've come in. Uh, those of you who are attendees, you still have an opportunity to submit some questions here for uh, Dr. Hemmer. And I'm going to start with the first one that came in. And it, this one is, what percentage of people who voted in the 1920 election were women? Since the 19th Amendment was ratified so close to the election, how was voter registration accomplished? Yeah, so I don't have those numbers right at my hand, but we do know that it was fairly uneven across the United States because there were states, primarily in the West, where women had actually had the right to vote for some time. Um, there were states like, I think it's, I can't remember if it's Wyoming or Montana, where the right for women to vote was actually embedded in the state constitution. It was one of those things that was um, that the, the people there were mandating. If they're going to join the United States, they want to make sure that women have the right to vote. So you would have seen more women voting in the West. Um, and there were also, you know, just depending on the culture of both the state and the locality where you were, um, not all women seized the right to vote. Right? There were plenty of women, including um, anti-suffragists, who believed that women didn't have a place in the voting booth, that they shouldn't be voting. And so there were a lot of things in addition to um, the process of registration, which was a little easier at the time, um, but there were things other than the process of registration that were keeping women out of the, the voting booth in 1920. Good, thank you. There's another uh, question that has uh, to do with the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, and the question is, how did it end? Other than people dying, how did it affect everyday life? Was social distancing practiced? Did people wear masks? Were schools closed? Large public gatherings canceled? Uh, or were these uh, health policies or practices not yet recognized? 
So a lot of these health policies were recognized over the course of the pandemic, but they were I would say unevenly applied across the United States. There are these very famous graphs that were circulating in the early days of the COVID pandemic that showed that where social gatherings, like massive social gatherings were still allowed in places like Philadelphia, um, people would get um, would gather in mass and they would get incredibly sick and you would see a huge spike in the number of cases and in the number of deaths, whereas there were places in California that banned all of these like mass social gatherings and the um, death rate and the, the just contraction rate were much lower. There were debates over masks in 1920. California was one of the places where th this happened, where Again, like people were kind of just figuring out how to do this. Masks themselves um, were kind of new in 1918. Um, they spread across the world. Um, in um, China and Japan for the first time, they're using masks during this pandemic. So coming off of some of the latest scientific and medical discoveries, they're encouraging the use of masks. But in places, I think it's like San Francisco, or somewhere in California, where you even get the, the development of an anti-mask league, because there are people who feel like the requirement to wear a mask, um, which was mandated in, in that city, um, were too much, right? That it was an infringement on people's rights. And so you see that same kind of conflict over what government can mandate and what people are willing to do. Um, so Definitely, you see a lot of the same kinds of conflicts. People are pretty scared. I mean, it comes on the back of, um, at the same time, and, and on the back of World War One, and so millions of people are dying in the war and then in the pandemic. It does eventually kind of peter out. I mean, by the time you get to 1920, the pandemic is still a trauma that Americans are coming out of, but it has largely ended. The use of masks, the need for social distancing has largely dissipated by 1920 because the flu itself has become less deadly, but also because more and more people are immune having contracted the disease already. Good, thank you. Uh, there, there is a comment that says uh, there are, these were great slides and photographs. And since I think we may have missed some at the beginning, would it be all right with you if we share those out, some, your slides in a separate email? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so okay. sorry about that. I could see them really Not big on my screen. But this way, uh, everybody will get slides. a chance to see all of them. I think that'll be kind of fun. Okay, another That would be fantastic. Actually, oh, um, I was just going to share really quickly just um, the first slide because I think that it goes to this pandemic oh, okay. question. Um, so let me just... Um, Go back for just a second because um, I really love, <laughs> really love this slide. Um, let's see if we can pull it up here. Um, you can see here women working in an office place. Clearly, they're not socially distanced, but they are all wearing masks. Um, and so that gives you kind of a that visual. I think is very familiar to those of us today who have been in a, a newly masked culture. That's great. Well, we'll make sure that uh, we'll get those slides in a separate email to all the attendees. Great. Uh, we've got time for an, another couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, Mitchell was with the Wilson administration. Was there a significant policy difference between Wilson and the Democrats and the Harding campaign? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know the answer to it. I do know that one of the things that happens over the course of the 1920s is that the Department of Justice and the particularly the Bureau of Investigation, which becomes the Federal Bureau of Investigation, continues to grow and amass power. And this is something that um, maybe Cheryl can speak to um, and might have the answer to. But um, even as some of the top line issues change um, because there is a, a major difference overall between the Wilson administration and the Harding administration. The, sometimes th th this bureaucracy, right, um, within the Department of Justice and um, within the, the new Bureau of Investigation um, continue to grow and they continue to grow in part because this fear of socialism is going to continue to be a through line in the United States. Um, Immigration becomes less of an issue by the end of the 1920s because there are new immigration restrictions put into place in 1921 and 1924 that dramatically reduce the amount of immigration to the U.S. and the source of immigration to the U.S. So in many ways, Palmer was, and the Palmer raids were 
the entering wedge of an anti-immigration movement in this period in which the deportation um, and the targeting of immigrants is actually going to become part of the overall immigration law in the United States. You no longer need the raids because you have an immigration law that no longer allows Eastern European immigrants into the U.S. Largely doesn't allow. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'll just mention right here that if, if we don't get to all the questions, and that's likely, we will make sure that uh, we, we get those posted on our website with answers uh, after the symposium. Uh, we have time for maybe another couple of quick ones. Uh, next one is we know racial demonstrations, in other words, Ku Klux Klan. Uh, were there anti-racial demonstrations in Ohio, the home state of both candidates? So I don't know if they happened in Ohio, but anti-racist demonstrations were happening in places like New York. Um, it's during this period that groups like the NAACP, which are fanning out across the nation, are holding anti-lynching dem demonstrations um, and and, you know, we wouldn't call them anti-racist at the time, but anti-racist demonstrations in the U.S. The, the issue sometimes is, and it would be interesting to look into, and maybe I can do this um, as a follow-up, look into what was happening in Ohio. You know, sometimes if there is not a critical mass of Black residents, it's actually pretty dangerous to do these kinds of anti-racist protests because they um, invite or they trigger um, anti-Black violence in ways that you know, even in 1920, um, many people will not want to bite. I think we'll try to get in one more quick question. The parallels of issues from 1920 and today is remarkable. Uh, what individuals or groups championed the 19th Amendments, labor movement, reduction of religious and racial tensions, and political extremes? Um, so which groups championed those particular, yes. those particular causes, there right. actually were so many of them. Like social movements in the 19 teens and 1920s were rampant throughout the United States. Um, and so there were groups um, who uh, worked on women's suffrage within that, um, especially following, um, uh, following 1920 black women's groups. Um, that worked for the expansion of women's right to vote, seeing that it hadn't been secured in the 19th Amendment. Groups like, um, obviously, the NAACP, but the Urban League um, were pretty important for, um, for Black rights. Um, you had the AFL, um, you had the CIO, you had the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, um, who were prominent within the labor movement. So there were there were social movements, grassroots and otherwise, that were honeycombed throughout the United States at this time, um, who come um, in this aftermath of the populist movement of the late 19th century and the progressive movement of the early 20th century, when you have kind of these high level reforms that are going on, but you have all of these people in the US who are pushing for an expansion of their rights, um, a change in the country to make it look more like what they'd like it to look like. Um, and you see that in these social movements. Well, that's all the time we have for questions and answers right now. Dr. Hemmer, thank you so much for joining us. And now we'll take a three minute break before we come back for our next presentation. Thank you. 
Welcome back, everyone. And now I'm going to queue up the second poll question of the afternoon. Again, if your responses will be shared with all attendees. So here's the question. Okay, here's the result. By 62% of you thought that the answer to the question, Marion ordered 75,000 of this food item to have on hand for notification day, the day that Warren Harding officially was the Republican nominee for president, was corn dogs. Well, maybe Sherry can uh, shed a little bit more light on that as we go along. And now it's, it's time for me to introduce to you our next speaker, who is Cheryl Smart Hall. Uh, Ms. Hall is a native of Marion, Ohio, and graduated from Heidelberg University with majors in English and American Studies. She began her career in journalism as a reporter for the Marion Star, where she also served as city editor and police reporter and the Sunday edition editor. She later served as copy editor and bureau chief for the Canton Repository. In 2009, Ms. Hall was named manager of the Harding Presidential Sites by the Ohio History Connection after serving eight years as coordinator of the site's educational outreach programs. She is the author of Warren G. Harding and the Marion Daily Star, How Newspapering Shaped a President. Will you please welcome Cheryl Smart Hall. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. So somebody will let me know if we, if we can't. So I want you to keep in mind what Dr. Hemmer was saying, of course, about these broad issues affecting America as a whole uh, in 1920, and you can see everything was in some way attached to the experience in the Great War. Um, both the recovery from it, which there was no real plan in mind, um, and the social issues that bubbled up out of that experience as well. So we're going to boil things down now and put another layer onto 1920. Uh, this is going to go into Marion's experience in hosting Senator Harding's front porch campaign. So I'm not gonna go too much into what Harding was talking about in the campaign. I'm going to go to how the community uh, actually made this work because I firmly believe if the community hadn't pulled this off the way it did, it would have been quite the disaster. Um, so let's start here. Now this uh, is interesting because this picture was taken exactly 100 years ago today and really at this very time. So if you've been strolling past the Harding home, you would have seen these men all assembling behind Warren and Florence Harding to get their picture taken. Uh, these are very special uh, men in this picture. These men used to be the newsboys who carried Warren Harding's Marion Daily Star and tossed it on your uh, porch every day. So they have formed the Harding Newsboys Club. They have come from all over the country. They met at the Marion Star on Center Street. And then they have marched the four blocks to the Hardings' home. Um, very proud to say that they had known the Hardings back in the day, but now they wanted to do their part to pushing Harding to the presidency. The campaign at this point was not quite two months old. It started on July 31st, so this is September 26th in this picture. It's only going to be a three-month campaign. 
So a lot of uh, difference between now and then as far as, as the way and the length of the campaign was conducted. Now Harding didn't give a speech on this day. It was a time for renewing friendships and reminiscing uh, about the antics of these men when they were boys. Uh, Mrs. Harding took some good natured ribbing about the time she had spanked a boy here and there and while she ran the home delivery operation. And when she asked for a show of hands from any alleged spanking victims, three raised their hands, including the current circulation manager, Jim Woods. Now that was a lighthearted event as compared to what had happened the day before when a large delegation of door-to-door -door salesmen, they called them traveling men, flooded Marion by train and automobile. So just to give you an idea how the campaign was built, uh, they called these groups delegations. And these were groups representing different factions of American life like our salesmen here who are not good at spelling. If you check out their spelling of the word Coolidge on their sign, they, that's not their big thing is the spelling. But they could be immigrants, uh, black uh, Americans. They were businessmen on some days, American Indians on other days. Um, very specialized kind of groups. And then Harding would give a customized speech to whatever their interest was. All of these delegations were scheduled in advance. So I know sometimes the idea is that this campaign was quite spontaneous, that people just came by the home and then he came out and spoke. And that's not what's going on here. Everything is scheduled in advance um, and the, there are certain days assigned for each delegation. So um, it's all part of the Republican machinery. Um, as far as that campaign went. Now, give you an example of what he might have spoken to. I know when he spoke to these men, he was talking about the economy. And of course, we're in a post-war recession. So they're concerned. Um, so this is one of those groups that Dr. Hemmer mentioned, you know, that concern about the economy. So they want to know from Harding, what's going to happen if he is elected president? What is going to happen with the economy? And first, what he does is assures them of their importance. His opponent, James Cox, also an Ohio newspaper man and sitting governor of Ohio, has intimated that door-to-door -door salesmen are nuisances. And Harding seizes that opportunity and says, oh no, and it, they are the backbone of American business. So they have flocked to the front porch on this day to hear more. So he has brought them into the campaign and a, Cox opened the door and he came through with this. So he's going to talk to them about their importance, especially in the rural parts of the country where they are kind of the lifeline as far as getting goods to a lot of isolated people, especially in the Midwest and the West. Uh, other days when American Indians came, he talked about his belief that they should be American citizens. They were not citizens yet. He spoke to farmers about how to get them back on their feet. Many had lost their farms after the end of World War I, or they were in danger of losing them at the moment. A lot of real problems facing Americans in 1920. Now these delegations were already supporters. So they're not really coming out here to learn a lot more. They're already going to most likely vote for Harding, just like the supporters at the Cox speeches were already Cox supporters. There are not protesters. There aren't people uh, doing investigative uh, reporting or things like that. These are already people inclined to vote for Harding. So it, this is really kind of a mild manner rally. Yeah if you want to think in today's terms. We've got a contingent of newspaper reporters working in the press house uh, behind the campaign headquarters, right on site there, not too far away. And they're going to write about not only what Harding is saying on days like this, but the reactions of the people in the crowd, what do they think of Harding's ideas. And they're going to send those stories to their home newspapers. And that's how word of what's going on in Marion, Ohio gets across the country. The reporters churned out hundreds of stories 
and including some amusing colorful tidbits when there wasn't a speech going on. This is one of my favorite days of the campaign. This is October 18th, so we're getting a little later into the campaign in this picture. Uh, the reporters told of the massive crowds in Marion for first voters day. So not only is the campaign bringing in those new women voters on this day, but any voters, college students who have turned 21 who are now eligible to vote. The restaurants in Marion were filled to capacity, which could be expected when 8,000 in the crowd are college students. 36 Ohio colleges were represented and they started a raucous cheering competition. This is what the Marion Star reported. All the front yards and porches in the vicinity of the Harding home were crowded with people. The roof of the home of Mrs. Wickstead, as she lived right across the street, being sunken today, so she's, her roof is sinking in, as a result of people climbing on it. Many climbed trees into the tops of the porches for vantage points from which to witness the parade and hear the speaking. The top of the Harding porch was pressed into service by moving pictures photographers. What a great image that is, and a fun story to go along with that more serious reporting about what Harding was saying in his speeches. So all of that done to give some life to what was happening in this campaign. The lines between the community and the campaign often blurred. For instance, a school teacher living next door to the Hardings proposed to the campaign that she write a newspaper column called The Girl Next Door. Campaign publicity manager Judson Welliver thought it was a great idea, and soon Eleanor's column had been picked up by newspapers across the country. The column provided folksy anecdotes that didn't make it into the news stories, but really helped readers get a feel for Harding and what this town was about and kind of what was going on behind the scenes. So here is an excerpt from one of her columns. She writes, I think it's very fortunate that the Hardings don't live in a great big castle with yards and yards of yard for a lot of people who come miles and miles to see them might get lost, but you can always find the Hardings. If Mrs. Harding is out on the big porch and sees you coming, She's right there to give you a glad hand and to say howdy do and make you feel that the next first lady of the land is a real American woman who knows how to bake her husband's pies as well as to tell you the reason why W.G. Harding is the best man in the USA. So again, reinforcing that quaint small town uh, feel of this campaign. So the campaign was, yes, a large part speech stumping a large part image, and a large part entertainment. You can imagine that folks in Marion hurried to the porch to see who the visitors were and to catch glimpses of anybody famous. Now I wanna go back to the Republican National Convention in June for just a minute. Harding won that nomination on the 10th round of voting on June 12th, which was his father's birthday. So what a great gift. Within days, Harding announces he's going to conduct a front porch campaign. Now that idea raised some eyebrows within the Republican Party leadership. A front porch campaign seemed cumbersome and old fashioned, certainly not in keeping with this new way of campaigning called barnstorming. Barnstorming consisted of zipping from city to city by train as quickly as possible, not a lot different than candidates do today, they just use used trains 100 years ago rather than airplanes. Harding's opponent, James Cox, was just starting a barnstorming tour. Harding was firm in his decision. So what inspired him to insist upon this front porch campaign? Well, he took his cue from the revered William McKinley, the martyred president from Ohio who had been in the White House 20 years earlier. Harding himself had given stump speeches for McKinley in 1896, when McKinley was running against gifted orator William Jennings Bryan. While Bryan embraced barnstorming as his campaign mode, which seemed very racy and almost uh, unthinkable at the time, McKinley hosted crowds of visitors around his front porch on North Market Street in Canton. 
McKinley reportedly said he couldn't compete against Brian in off the cuff speeches on the road. So he was better at memorizing his speeches than delivering them in the controlled atmosphere of the front porch. He also stayed at home to protect his wife, Ida, who suffered from epilepsy and needed his care. Nobody could argue about the results. McKinley won with 271 electoral votes. The notion of a front porch campaign in 1920 did have a lot of supporters though. The New York Times reported that Harding's neighborhood was perfect. Frank Parker Stockbridge, reporter for the Times, said there is room for considerable multitude on the Harding lawn the next door neighbor's lawn and the sidewalk and street in front of the house. It would not be difficult, I should say, to dispose some 10,000 persons so they would be within hearing of the candidate's voice as he spoke from the circular end of the porch. He has a strong voice, pitched to carry well either up or down wind. Compliment if somebody, I guess, tells you your voice can carry up or down wind. He was right. Even with the Harding's modest sized property, thousands of people could crowd onto the Harding's front yard, spill into the street, and the neighbor's yards. It wasn't pretentious. It wasn't contrived. It was absolutely Midwest. It was absolutely small town. It fit Harding to a T. Just as important was the role that Florence Harding would play. Like Ida McKinley, Florence had chronic health problems. Harding needed her participation, especially given the likely prospect that women would be voting for president for the first time. She had a great story to tell. A single mother after the divorce from her first husband, a working woman from her days with the Star News Voice, an ardent believer in her husband's potential. She believed women had a responsibility to become engaged in their nation by exercising their right to vote. Harding knew that Florence would be an effective campaigner on the road, but he also know, knew that a woman with chronic kidney disease should not be traipsing all over the country. So this is a, a, a idea for this campaign also was meant to protect Florence as well and to keep her strength uh, up through the whole thing. It is easy to understand why a front porch campaign appealed to Harding and had deep symbolism for him. Placing the campaign in Marion illustrated a major point. Harding's life had been built on the backs of rural communities. He was a small town businessman, a newspaper editor. He knew that once people came to Marion, they would see their own small towns reflected in his. He knew visitors would see Marion's courthouse and comment that, oh, it looked very familiar. He would feel comfortable in the small town culture that they also knew. This is just at the time when people are moving, starting to move from the farms and rural communities more to the metropolitan areas. There's still a lot of people that lived in towns almost identical to Marion. The front porch itself represented something familiar, something thoroughly American, something normal in the nation's post-war adjustment. By seeing Harding on the porch of his modest home, in his hometown, people would know Harding. I wanna introduce you to Dan Christinger. While the Republican Party began scheduling delegations to come to Marion, the community put its foundation in place too. They only had a few weeks to do this. Dan Christinger, who had known Harding since boyhood, both had grown up in the Marion County village of Caledonia. Uh, boyhood friends, uh, Dan was a lawyer. He also was vice president on two bank boards. He was also a Democrat, and that really didn't matter much to Harding. Harding had a lot of Democrat um, acquaintances and, and people he worked with that was, uh, bipartisanship was, was something he absolutely believed in. Um, Dan takes up the role as point man for the community. He's president of the Marion Civic Association, which is the precursor to the Chamber of Commerce. The first thing he did was travel to Canton to talk to folks who had helped the McKinley campaign. 
He wanted to see how they went about hosting thousands of visitors. And one of the things he learned was that the McKinley yard had turned to a sea of mud after thousands of feet trod across it. He told the Harding campaign that spreading limestone gravel would prevent that from happening. So we see in this picture that this is when we've got some limestone gravel that's been dumped here in the yard ready to be spread out for people to stand on for the rest of the campaign. Again, learning from that McKinley campaign. But this 1920 front porch campaign was going to be a lot more complicated than the one 24 years earlier. Uh, for one thing, in 1896, you know, McKinley campaign just had to worry about uh, carriages, buggies, and trains coming to Canton. We've got automobiles. You have even more passenger trains now. You've got um, the newsreel cameras. You've got a lot of this more, this machinery, this campaign machinery to turn out the message. So it's a lot, um, I guess, more orchestrated is, is a way to put it. It's, it's, there's a lot more detail to it than there was uh, for McKinley's, but it gave them a good starting point. So Christinger calls a meeting on July 2nd for all the proprietors in the restaurant, hotel, bakery, and grocery businesses. He also calls together the butchers and representatives from fraternal lodges and churches. The Hardings are scheduled to return to Marion from Washington on July 5th. Okay, so he's been nominated on, on June 12th. July 5th, he's going to come home and spend the next few couple weeks getting the campaign ready, and then it's going to open the end of July. So Dan Christinger says, well, there's going to be a lot of hometown people welcoming the Hardings home. This is a great trial run for what we're going to have to do for the next few months. Christinger is not happy when the turnout at the meeting was pretty low. He said Marionites did not understand the onslaught of humanity, which would soon be on their doorstep. His idea then was to create dozens of committees and then they could have individual meetings and that worked much better. So the hotels and rooms committee, the auto committee, the Marion beautification committee, the restaurant and food committee and on and on were born. So meanwhile, Flamorne and Florence are packing up their Washington home and we're preparing to return to Marion to prepare for the campaign. Florence made a last minute visit to the new Warren G. Harding for President National Headquarters, which had opened in a second floor suite at the New Ebbett Hotel in Washington. She couldn't resist slipping a piece of stationery off the stack and writing a quick note to Marion friend George Christian Sr., father of her husband's private secretary. Who would have ever thought the Hardings would come to this, she wrote. W.G. is really a philosopher about political fortunes. He smiles on adverse criticism, thinks much of it deserved, feels a strange pity for many who are fooled by noisy pretense or caught by the bunk. I fear our hero worship is ruined for all time. So on July 5th, the Hardings arrived back in Marion to a community bursting with excitement. The Hardings had motored home in a convoy of automobiles from Washington. Trailing along after their car was a contingent of journalists, many of whom would take up residency in Marion for the next four or five months, boarding in rooms in the Harding neighborhood or in some of the hotels in town. That afternoon, Christinger welcomed the large crowd which had gathered in front of the Hardings' home to welcome back their famous neighbors. This is a great year and the supreme hour in our civic life, he shouted. This day marks the beginning of a new epic for Marion and its citizens. Clearly, Harding was glad to be home. He said, you come this afternoon with a manifestation of friendship and confidence, which would fill any human heart to overflowing. I'm so truly grateful. I feel it all so deeply that words fail to convey all the appreciation which is in my heart. Now, as I said, the campaign is going to open on July 31st, but, um, but a mammoth test for both the campaign operation and Marion's hosting duties would occur on July 22nd. That's notification day. Now, notification day is an old time tradition. We don't do it anymore. 
uh, when the leaders of either party would go to that candidate's hometown and say, hey, you've been nominated. And that came from early colonial days when somebody would have to get on a horse and ride for days to the candidate's home. Certainly, both Hardy and Cox already knew they'd been nominated. Harding's then going to give an acceptance speech saying, yes, I accept that nomination. So this is where it's going to occur. This is Garfield Park in Marion, and that's the Chautauqua Pavilion. So that's where the event's going to happen at two o'clock on July 22nd. Dan Christinger is figuring about 100,000 people are expected to come. Now that's in addition to Marion's 28,000 population. So this is going to be a true test. He said the main goal was to provide each visitor with the best experience Marion had to offer, from fairly priced and tasty food to comfortable accommodations and friendly residents. Just as residents of Canton had aspired to 24 years earlier, Marion residents also wanted people to love their town. A few days before notification day, Police Chief Jim Thompson announced in the Star the city's plans for handling the crowds. Marion is to be host to a large number of visitors, he said, and all citizens of Marion will do their part in assisting in the entertainment of the visitors. So clearly, you really weren't being given a choice in the whole thing. The Marion County Automobile Association got permission to use a large tract of land near the park here uh, to park automobiles. And the Boy Scouts are gonna end up overseeing those cars to make sure that nobody gets near them. A large number of ex-servicemen, remember this is just after the war, as well as members of the Army's D Company were going to assist in directing visitors about the city. They're gonna be helped by deputy sheriffs, firemen and railroad police. The city adopted the slogan. Now, I don't think this is a great slogan. I think they could have come up with something better, but you can be the judge. It's come one, come all. And they prepared for this onslaught of visitors. Their first order of business they decided was to provide two meals for each visitor. It's a heck of a lot of food. The Lincoln Park Association took charge of providing food for 5,000 people on the school grounds on West Center Street. They ordered, here's the answer to your trivia question, 75,000 buns and were roasting 32 quarters of beef. The dinner was to consist of roast beef, potatoes and gravy, beans, coffee, cake and ice cream for a dollar per plate. That's about $13 in today's money. Restaurants were stocked to the brim and sandwich stands, which they called emergency restaurants at the time, were erected all over the city. Churches and lodges each signed up to feed 400 to 600 visitors two meals each. Most of Marion's hotel rooms were booked, but the Civic Association had a backup plan. They had a list of more than a thousand rooms that they pre-approved. I have no idea what the cr criteria was. Visitors could lease a room for 75 cents to $1.50 per night. So that's about 10 to $47 per night in today's money. Many of Marion's businesses adjusted their work schedules. Due to the difficulty in navigating the city streets on Thursday, notification day, the city ice delivery company said it would make no deliveries on that day. And it was pretty blunt about it. It said, get what you need on Wednesday. That's what their ad said. Eight to 900 visitors wearing special badges were assigned to various points throughout the city to provide directions and answer questions. In addition, if you owned a car, you were expected to provide rides to visitors to supplement the buses and streetcars. Additional comfort stations were provided and they said they were adding more restrooms for women and children. I, I don't know the difference between comfort stations and restrooms and I'm, I'm perplexed by the fact that only women and children were mentioned as the restroom uh, applicants there. So I, I don't know what's going on there as far as the men go. Uh, let's not forget the committee monitoring the train station. Marion expected 29 special trains. Those were kind of like chartered buses. You would reserve train cars 
in addition to regularly scheduled trains. The Civic Association printed 10,000 railroad timetables of departure times to hand out to visitors seeking this information. So they thought their responsibility too is to make, every, make sure everybody was greeted, had a good time here, but also got on the right train going home. Since four railroads served Marion, train callers with megaphones were stationed on street corners downtown to remind visitors of departure train times and when to, where to meet their trains, since the train station couldn't handle all of the uh, visitors at once. So the first train passengers that day are gonna arrive at 6 a.m. The last would pull out at midnight. So it was absolutely a packed day. Now, Christinger puts the care of female visitors in the hands of the Civic Association's Women's Auxiliary. And Mrs. J.T. Matthews, she organizes the women into welcoming committees for the train station at hotels. Visitors who have ever come to the city, the Star reported. All women in Marion, too, are expected to do their share in entertaining the visiting women. Don't wait to be told what to do, Christianger said, but take it upon yourself to be a hostess and make every stranger feel that she is welcome. The parade from the train station downtown past the Hardings' home was an entirely different animal to organize. And in addition, there's going to be a women's parade. So we can see that importance of these prospective voters in the Harding campaign. Always led by Marion's uh, bipartisan Harding Marching Club, the main parade had six marching bands, multiple Harding and Coolidge marching clubs, delegations made up of 500 to 2,000 people each, and a lot of decorated vehicles like you see in this picture here. And you see a lot of people had trouble with grammar then, just like today, if you see the word it's there. A separate women's parade, as I said, is going to take place. And all Marian women were actually let out of um, their workplaces in order to participate if they wanted to. So that's pretty progressive, really. They're encouraged to wear white, but if you don't have something white to wear, you can wear anything you want, they'll take you. That women's parade is underscoring that final push for passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, so if ratified by Tennessee, that's a 36 state, women were gonna be able to vote in the November election. We know that that did happen. Work had been progressing night and day on the decorations along the parade route. The columns had been repurposed from a gathering of Civil War GAR veterans. Each column had a large eagle on top and were supposed to be illuminated at night, but that never happened. Red, white, and blue bunting, campaign signs, posters of Harding are all throughout the town. In the end, the police department said they thought about 75,000 visitors came to Marion and the day was deemed a success. The arrangements carried out for notification day were a template for the campaign itself which opened on July 31st. Imagine doing all of the things I described for notification day at least 24 more times over the next three months. Christinger still had to make sure that meals, parades, rooms in hotels and private residences, first aid stations and entertainment were in place twice, twice a week for the next three months. The big campaign days, as we said, were Wednesdays and Saturdays, and only in mid-October did the locals get a break when Harding was out of town on several three and four day rail trips to 13 different states. The Republican Party paid for the campaign staff expenses as well as for rail costs for some of the visiting delegations when uh, there were complaints about having to absorb those high rail fees themselves. Marionites, for their part of the campaign, they were on their own. They donated thousands of hours of their time and a lot of money to play their role. In return, they were repaid with appearances in newsreel films, opportunities to brush shoulders with people like Lillian Russell and General Pershing, and the experience of a summer and fall like no other. After three months, the local community, member population 28,000, had hosted more than 600,000 visitors in just three months. 
I don't believe that the campaign would have been at all successful without the community's uh, involvement and, and their willingness to support uh, their hometown hero here. It doesn't mean everybody in Hart and Marion supported Harding. There's never any 100% vote in support, but certainly the majority of people did. Um, it was something that we probably would never see again as far as any community participating wholeheartedly like Marion did a hundred years ago. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry. We appreciate uh, that interesting uh, perspective on what happened here in Marion. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're really out of time uh, before our break. So what I'm going to repeat to all attendees is that we will take all, we will gather all the questions that you've submitted and ask our presenter to answer those respond to those and we will post them on the Harding Symposium website uh, probably at the beginning of this week. So I apologize for not being able to get to those questions right now, but it is time for our next break before our final presentation. Thank you everyone and we are back from our final break and now it's time for our third and final poll question for this afternoon. Once again, please share your responses. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ah, interesting. Which political party, Republicans or Democrats, has changed its platform the most in the past 100 years? And it is close uh, between the answer Democrat, 42%, and both, 36%. I'm sure we're going to learn uh, more about that in our next session. Uh, Michael D. Barone is an American conservative political analyst, historian, pundit, and journalist. He's the principal author of The Alma Mac of American Politics, a highly detailed reference work on Congress and state politics, published biennially since 1972 by the National Journal. He is also a regular commentator on United States elections and political trends for Fox News Channel. For 18 years, Mr. Barone was employed by the U.S. News and World Report, leaving to join the staff of the Washington Examiner. He is currently based at the American Enterprise Institute as a resident fellow. He has written numerous books and essays on American political and demographic history, including his most recent, How America's Political Parties Change and How They Don't Change. Mr. Michael Barone. Oh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, it's an honor to be with you here at the Warren G. Harding Symposium. And uh, it, it, the, uh, and a pleasure to listen to the informative and uh, fascinating, uh, enlightening uh, talks by Nicole Hemmer and Cheryl Smart Hall, uh, both fascinating and interesting. Um, next November 2nd, that's 37 days from now, will mark the 100th anniversary of the election in which Warren Glamalil Harding was chosen the 29th president of the United States with the largest popular vote percentage margin in the 164 year history of the competition between the Republican and the Democratic parties. It's a long competition uh, and it's a considerable record. Um, despite uh, that significant electoral uh, achievement, uh, Warren Harding, as most, as most people who follow these things know, has often been rated as one of our uh, worst presidents by panels of historians. Um, one notes that the panels of historians have tended to be partisan Democrats and their condemnation of Harding continues to echo partisan Democratic rhetoric of the 1930s and 40s. Um, they focus on some scandals in the administration as if no other administration had scandals uh, on Harding's uh, uh, personal peccadillos, an odd subject for the condemnation by followers of the party of Bill Clinton and John F. Kennedy. Um, but most importantly, they portray the 1920s as a wild, frivolous party, uh, predictably followed uh, in, in by the inevitable and deserved hangover of the Great Depression as if all the genuine gains and achievements of America in the 1920s never happened or were just a mirage. Uh, I think this 100th anniversary is a good time for re-examination, for discarding the partisan rhetoric of three and four generations ago on which the statute of limitations ought to have been pa passed a long time ago, and try to make a clear-eyed assessment of the political career and the public policies of Warren G. Harding. Uh, my thesis is that he was a serious and consequential president with significant accomplishments in his sadly abbreviated term in office. Let me make three points in offering this assessment. The first is that Harding uh, had a shrewd and prescient instinct for public opinion, a positive quality in any president. My second point is that he had a sense of his own strengths and limitations, and that he appointed serious and accomplished men to high positions, uh, who perhaps in response to a hidden hand in the White House, uh, made major accomplishments in public policy. My third point is that Warren Harding, coming to office at the high tide of racial segregation in the United States, when that seemed to be the ineluctable wave of the future, made an until now largely unappreciated and at times politically risky effort to assert and advance the principle of racial equality. On the first point, Warren Hart G. Harding grew up in a professional household in the small city of Marion, Ohio, which we've heard so much about. His father and brother were 
And he was a journalist. Um, his 1920 Democratic opponent, James M. Cox, was also a journalist uh, based in the Dayton Daily News and, and a much more successful one. He was the founder of a company called Cox Communications, which uh, made his daughter Ann Cox Chambers, who died earlier this year at age 100, worth $14 billion. Uh, this was a much larger fortune uh, than any of the Hardings uh, ever amassed. Um, but as, a, as, a, as an editorial writer, uh, as uh, like many other editorial writers of the day who became politicians, and they include people like Senator Carter Glass of Virginia, Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan. Uh, Harding was given to kind of florid and grandiloquent prose, which was ridiculed in his time by journalists like H.L. Mencken. Uh, Harding's prose is, is uh, a little hard to read today, um, but in my judgment, so is Mencken's. Um, which has a sort of ornate and grandiloquent uh, tone to it, which uh, strikes us wrong to our ears. Um, and, um, but I think that uh, while Mencken's prose won favors among, uh, favor among literary elites in the 1920s, I would make the case that Harding's prose spoke directly to the voters to allay their fears and arouse their hopes. A famous example is his speech at the Home Market Club in Boston in May 1920, uh, when he was only a lightly regarded dark horse candidate for president uh, at the convent, Republican convention that was to take place a month later. Uh, and in the presence of the two candidates who were rivals for the vice presidency at that uh, convention, uh, Irvine Lenrud and, and Calvin Coolidge. America's present need, Harding said, is not heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalcy, not revolution, but restoration, not surgery, but serenity, not the dramatic, but the dispassionate, not experiment, but equal poise. Now it's easy uh, to ridicule Harding's assiduous alliteration. Uh, there, I've actually done it myself. Uh, and his use of the unusual word normalcy, which however has been appearing in dictionaries uh, for more than 60 years. But consider the context, the political context to which uh, Nicole Hemmer has spoken earlier in this, uh, in this symposium. Um, the America had just been through a world war in which it had lost more than 100,000 men in 18 months. Uh, in comparison, a death toll much higher than what the United States has suffered in recent years in Iraq and Afghanistan, which totals about 7,000 men. Um, America had just gone through debate over and rejection of a peace treaty, uh, which in its original terms, the Versailles Treaty, would have obligated it to go to war again to beck and call the international body. This was the great project of President Woodrow Wilson uh, and which he refused to compromise on. Um, America had just suffered through a severe bout of inflation, was heading into a severe bout of unemployment. Um, Hardy used the words, not revolution, but restoration. Um, I think that was more significant and, and, and uh, it, it meant more to his listeners at that time than it would mean to Americans today. For Americans then were aware of the communist revolution in Russia. Uh, the, the communists had taken over the country with the largest land area, one of the largest populations in the world of communist attempted revolutions in Berlin and Bavaria and Budapest, of the Red Army's advance on newly advanced Poland, uh, aware of the massacre of the Young Turks regime's massacre of the Armenians, uh, there was a proposal for the U.S. to take a protectorate of Armenia. Um, the world was in turmoil, and so was the situation at home. Uh, Nicole Hammer talked about the bombing on Wall Street in September 1920, um, but this was only one of several uh, anarchist bombings 
Uh, you had the bombing in front of the home of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer on R Street in New York, directly across the street from the home of the young family of Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, workers went on strike more frequently in 1919 than any other year in American history, and Seattle was passed, uh, was paralyzed by a general strike. Um, if we look back today and say that the uh, that the the red raids, the red scare of the time, seems like uh, people scared about nothing. But in point of fact, Americans in 1920 did not know that the communists would not be successful in other countries. They had taken over and totally changed the government of regime of, of, of one of the greatest nations in the world. There was no way to be sure they wouldn't do it. And of course, in Russia, that regime held on for 70 years and killed tens of millions of people. Great things were at stake in that world. Um, and the world seemed to be in a, a turmoil um, that was even greater than we uh, think of today. Um, you had uh, forces. Uh, we talked about the Ku Klux Klan, uh, racism. Henry Ford, uh, with his anti-Semitic writings. He had been a Democratic candidate for senator in 1918. The, um, the Democrats were the party of the Ku Klux Klan at that time. Uh, and you had, um, it, you had also, of course, the pandemic of the, um, the, the so-called Spanish flu, which had been going on. Uh, the death toll in the United States from the, that flu, by the way, was 650,000 estimated in a country that had one third the population today. Proportionally, if we were to have a death toll of that kind, it would be two million people, 10 times as many people as are said to have died from the COVID um, the coronavirus at this point. So there was a turmoil in the land, things, a sense that things were out of control. Um, and the, the, the listening to Harding's words, the alliteration there, it suggests to me that he had a clear sense that the policies and the person of the incumbent Democratic president, Woodrow Wilson, uh, were in shambles. Wilson had once been crisply articulate, uh, had been an active um, advocate and successful advocate of legislation before a Democratic Congress. Um, but he suffered a severe stroke in September 1919. He was an invalid out of the public view. He was utterly rejected. Uh, his job performance rating, if we had had public opinion polls at that time, we didn't get them until 1935, I think would have been at a record low. He was simply not in public view. So there was a sense that the world was going out of control, a sense that the United States was going out of control, a sense that there was no leadership in the White House. And in that realm, uh, Harding uh, is saying that he, he will provide a sense of normalcy. Uh, a sense of uh, restoration, a sense of uh, not revolution, but restoration. And I think that he was showing a shrewd political instinct. And although there were, at that time, as journalism goes, the wide predictions of who would win the uh, popular vote and so forth, the fact is that Warren Harding won the popular vote by 60 to 34 percent, a margin of 26 percent. No one has ever done better than that. And it was a victory of national proportions. Harding carried every northern state, carried the southern states of West Virginia, Tennessee, lost Kentucky by just 3,999 votes. He carried all five boroughs of New York City and 73% in Philadelphia. He carried the big industrial cities of Cleveland and Detroit and Chicago by more than two to one. Uh, he won Irish voters, cats angry at Wilson's alliance with Brooklyn, uh, with Britain. German voters angry at his suppression of German culture uh, and jailing of uh, war critics, even while maintaining traditional Republicans who had been there. Uh, and that leads me to my second point, which is that Harding showed a huge, Harding made a number of statements where he said, I'm not really up to this job, but he wasn't afraid to hire uh, really uh, major people uh, to take major public jobs. As Secretary of State, he named Charles Evans Hughes, who'd been governor of New York, Supreme Court justice, nearly successful Republican nominee for president in 1916. Hughes negotiated the Washington Naval Treaty 
kept up a policy of engagement with Europe um, in, positive, uh, in a positive way, not the isolationist that some of the Democratic historians have charged. As Treasury Secretary, he hired Andrew Mellon, one of the richest men in America, who put together a venture capitalist and banker who put together major companies like Gulf Oil, Coa, Aluminum. Um, Harding pushed, uh, Mellon pushed successfully for tax cuts and the high wartime tax rates, leaving only the highest earners subject to tax. And the result, as with the tax cuts in 1964 and 81, was enormous economic growth, uh, which was not a mirage, but a reality a reality visible to Americans who had electricity in their houses and refrigerators and washing machines and radios who drove automobiles. Uh, horse population peaked in 1920 uh, and uh, attendant urban street pollution. Um, and they went to the new movie palaces. Uh, he started the Bureau of the Budget, installing Charles G. Dawes, who'd been campaign manager as a young man for McKinley 25 years before created an institutional culture of excellence and rigor, which still uh, is a major important positive part of the federal government 100 years later. Uh, and as common sec secretary, he installed Herbert Hoover, man of the, the great uh, relief administrator, uh, who responded to things like the Mississippi River floods of 1927, built the enormous Commerce Department building in Washington, which is much bigger than the Treasury, um, and so forth, and ultimately was elected president himself. Um, Harding's Republicans had significant accomplishments on the tariff, uh, which they increased over the Democratic lines, but not the negative effects of the Smoot-Hawley tariff Hoover signed in 1930. Um, they passed immigration laws restricting uh, immigration, in particular from South, Southern and Eastern Europe. I'm not a fan of these laws, but they were laws that had a significant effect. Their fans have said, look, they enabled Americans to assimilate immigrants from a culturally diverse background so that we could fight as a unified nation in World War II and blend people together. Harding's willingness to appoint men with far more impressive credentials and experience be, speaks a certain humility and perhaps as one of his biographers, Andrew Sinclair, argues, um, he was uh, pretending to be casual and lazy. He allowed others to take the burden of pushing through measures. If they succeeded, he'd take his credit. If he failed, the fault was there. In, in this view, Harding was a hidden hand presidency, much like Dwight Eisenhower's 30 years later. And by the way, Eisenhower was stationed in Washington during much of Harding's presidency. I wonder if he took lessons from his example. In any case, the, rec rec the, the record of the Harding administration was one of serious policy making and impressive achievement. It wasn't just a frivolous party. That leads me to my third point. Um, the uh, one where Harding gets a failing grade by current standards, uh, but one where we have to understand the issues of the time race and civil rights. Harding was a graduate of Ohio Central College, one of those Midwestern institutions like Oberlin and Hillsdale today, which were from the beginning open to women and blacks. Uh, he graduated in 1882 when memories of the Civil War and the post-war amendments were still fresh, but when the tide was turning against equal rights for black Americans. Reconstruction civil rights laws were watered down by the courts, Southern Democrats barred Blacks from voting in Southern state after Southern state, imposed racial segregation, turned a blind eye to multiple lynchings every year. Woodrow Wilson, often lionized as a liberal president, imposed racial segregation in the federal government and angrily rejected charges to change it. This was the high tide in history of American racial segregation and discrimination. And Harding stood against it. If the United States cannot protect, prevent segregation in its own service, he said, we are not in any sense a democracy. He decried brutal unlawful violence and supported the anti-lynching law passed by Republicans in the House, killed by Southern Democrats in the Senate. 20 years later, Franklin Roosevelt refused to buy that anti-lynching law. Harding backed it. 
Um, I want you to know I believe in the equality before the law, he told black leaders. Uh, and he spoke out against the Tulsa race massacre mentioned earlier in these proceedings in July 1921. In October 1921, he told a segregated audience in Birmingham, Alabama, that he supported equal voting rights for blacks. There was an applause from the black part of the audience. Um, these initiatives, which seem timid probably to us today, were taken against the tide of a public opinion. And I think they are evidence of a severe, a sincere belief that all men are created equal. And they're also evidence of a certain kindliness characteristic of this man. Harding opposed and oratorically attacked Woodrow Wilson, but he also quietly as president ordered Wilson's Navy physician to remain stationed in Washington where he could care for the former president. Wilson was unaware of this. The Wilson administration had prosecuted and imprisoned social pre socialist presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs, he got 900,000 votes in 1912 and 1920. Deb, they imprisoned Debs for criticizing entry into World War I and opposing the military draft. This was imposing, this was a real violation of my view of civil liberties. Wilson refused to um, free Debs, insisted on the prosecution and so forth, because Debs, like the 56 members of Congress who voted against entry into World War I, uh, opposed the war effort. Um, Harding ended prosecution of war opponents, and in December 1921, he commuted Debs' pris prison sentence. I want him to eat Christmas dinner with his wife, he said, but he first insisted that Debs visit him at the White House. Well, I have heard so damn much about you, Mr. Debs, he said, that I am now glad to meet you personally. Perhaps it is time now, a hundred years after his election, for the American people to meet personally, a president with a record, not of heroics, but of healing, not nostrums, but normalcy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Barone. We really appreciate your, your joining us this afternoon and giving us those uh, insights into Harding and his, his uh, presidency. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions is this, what were the policy differences between Wilson and Harding? Uh, well, Wilson, uh, Harding had opposed uh, as a Senator some of the uh, policies, the, the so-called progressive policies of, um, of, Wil of Wilson. He, had, uh, he, had been, he was a supporter of William Howard Taft when Theodore Roosevelt challenged him in 1912 for the Republican nomination and was one of the keynote speakers for Taft at the Republican convention. Uh, he didn't feel that government should interfere as much in the economy. But as I suggest also, uh, he was more uh, favorable towards free civil liberties for people who oppose government policies um, than was uh, President Wilson uh, of the Democratic Party. Um, the Democratic Party had major Ku Klux Klan uh, support and its 1924 convention refused by a narrow margin uh, a resolution to uh, repudiate the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Harding, as I mentioned, stood otherwise uh, on that. So I think that uh, it's a mistake to see the differences between the parties as being identical to what they are today or what partisans say they are today. I think that uh, Harding, uh, Harding took a view which uh, many, closer to that on some issues, than many so-called liberals would uh, take in America today. Uh, and uh, sort of tolerance, I think, for uh, diversity and for uh, other people. I think also in the spirit of William McKinley, um, the Republican Party in War of Warren Harding was not as strongly critical of labor unions as the Republican Party became after the industrial unions were created and, and through, in part through force and violence uh, organized um, the industrial uh, firms in the late 1930s in the Franklin Roosevelt years. You had a sort of labor versus management um, dichotomy 
uh, starting in the late 1930s and going up into the 1960s at least. That didn't really exist in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, the issues were different there. And Harding stood, of course, for the tax cuts, similar to those proposed by President Kennedy in the 1960s and President Reagan in the 1980s. Uh, and the bounteous economic growth of the United States um, and the uh, continuing industrial project, one of the reasons that the United States could be the arsenal of democracy uh, and, and, and so forth as organized in part by President Roosevelt, 1940-41, um, is because of the growth and development of industrial plant and equipment through the prosperity of the 1920s. Uh, we won the war, as Alan Greenspan once said to me in conversation, uh, because we had, uh, we had built uh, the industrial plant that uh, was capable of producing the equipment and, and, uh, that we needed. Um, and that was an achievement of the 1920s, for which I think Warren G. Harding deserves some credit. Thank you. I just have a couple more comments. I think you might like this. Uh, your comments and factual citations point to a need for a revisited review of the Harding presidency. A next book for you, maybe? Well, I have written a book called Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan, which basically uh, goes from 19, political narrative from 1930 to 88. And one of the things that I begin it with is um, looking through America uh, <clears throat> in 1930 from the point of view of two, two politicians, Charles F. Murphy, the uh, Democratic leader of Tammany Hall, who was one of the creators of orienting Democrats towards a welfare state in New York and then the nation, uh, and William Howard Taft, the former president, defeated in 1912 when his patron Teddy Roosevelt ran against him, but who was appointed Chief Justice of the United States by Warren Harding in 1921, one of four appointments President Harding had uh, to the Supreme Court. And I think they were pretty distinguished appointments. We can make that case at length. So um, I, you know, the, 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 many re Americans have been kind of prisoners of the New Deal historians of Arthur Schlesinger Jr., William Luchtenberg, uh, many uh, others who were wonderful writers, great style, and significant scholars, but they have always betrayed the 1920s as just a prelude to the 1930s. And the Republican presidents were so frivolous and incompetent that they produced, uh, their policies naturally produced the Great Depression, and they were rebuked by that. And then the history is that Roosevelt was right about everything. I think that that is a view that is overly partisan uh, and fails to take account of the appreciations and achievements, which you may or may not agree with. I don't agree with their immigration bills, for example, uh, of the presidents and the Cong Republican Congresses of the 1920s, which I think were substantial. Um, we've, you know, Nicole Hammer, the first speaker in this country, <laughs> really eloquently about what a mess America was in, in 1919 and 1920, what severe problems we had, how things seemed to be going wildly out of control. One of the stories of the 1920s is that changed. The country improved. The economic growth occurred. We did not have a resumption of the racial uh, uh, violence against black people diminished. We had um, the strikes and labor strife was reduced. Incomes were increased. All those washing machines and refrigerators meant that women not only had the vote, they had a heck of a lot of more time and a lot less drudgery in their households. They, and they could listen to the radio. Uh, while they went about their work. So um, there were some real achievements there that uh, and improvements in American life that were in part the results of President Harding, of his successor, President Coolidge, of the Republican Congresses of the 1920s. Well, thank you. I'll just end this seg segment with uh, one more comment. And this comment came from one of our attendees. It said, thank you so much. I hope to visit Marion again.
as soon as the new presidential library is opened. And I would be honored to meet you too, Mr. Barone. So I well, agree with that. It's been a pleasure for me to, uh, to meet you and thank you so much for being with us. I also want to thank again, Nicole Hemmer and Sherry Hall for being here today. And as we conclude, I have several other people I want to recognize. Special thanks go to Karenza Aiken and her wonderful staff at the Office of Advancement Events and Programs. Uh, Karenza, without your guidance and support, this event just would not have been possible. Thank you so much. I also want to thank key members of our Ohio State Marion staff, including Kathy Gerber, Emily Cressup, and Wayne Rowe. And thank you to all the attendees of this symposium webinar for joining us both from both near and far. And now I have one other pleasant announcement. For the first time this year, we've created the Warren G. Harding Symposium Student Award, which will be presented annually to an Ohio State Marion student who submits an original essay of 1,000 words or less based on the theme of the annual Warren G. Harding Symposium. Thanks to the generosity of the Harding family, an award of $1,000 has been presented to our inaugural winner, selected by a committee composed of Ohio State Marion faculty, staff, and advisory committee members. We are pleased to announce that the winner of the first annual Warren G. Harding Symposium Student Award is Kyle Meadows, with an essay titled, On the Campaign Trail of Warren G. Harding. Kyle is a sophomore here at Ohio State Marion. I believe he's joined us today on this webinar as well. He is undecided about a major, but is leaning toward journalism. I think that might be a wise move for you, Kyle. The winning essay will soon be posted on the Harding Symposium website. Congratulations, Kyle, and thank you to the Harding family. Before you leave this afternoon, we hope that you'll take a moment to complete the survey av available on this site. Your feedback will be very helpful as we plan future events. And finally, I hope that you will be able to join us. I hope that we'll all be able to join together next year in a live version of the Warren G. Harding Symposium on July 16th and 17th, 2021. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you.